Hey guys, it's Heidi with AMP Home Church, and welcome back. We are in the Seeing the Unseen by Randy Alcorn, going through the study. Today is day 19, topic being seeking God's will. Huge topic, one that is very important, one that I really don't think is discussed or taught on like it should be. Um, so I'm really excited that we get to dig into this today. Um, really want to encourage us all that when we are done kind of going over this today, that we take this to prayer, that we search the scriptures, we read on this, and we really hold that mirror up and look at ourselves and go, am I truly doing that? Am I truly surrendering my thoughts, my opinions, my desire, what I want, and instead saying, Lord, I am seeking your will. Let your will be done. So let's dive into this. He starts by quoting Colossians 3.16 that says, the Bible is the revealed will will of God. If you want to live in his will, then let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Amen? Knowing the will of God has become much easier for me as years pass. It's not that I have to know exactly where to go, but that I ask him for direction and insight. Seek to surrender each day to him and ask him to bring into my life those divine appointments that make life so interesting. God appoints the times and places we live. We can go to Acts 17, 26 for that. And he is a master of exact timing. The Bible is the revealed will of God. If you want to live in his will, then let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. Like Colossians 3, 16 says. Fill your heart and mind with the word of God. Trust in his empowerment to obey him and confess and repent when you disobey and fail. If you do this, you will be living in the will of God. So let's look at that. Do we fill our hearts and minds with the word of God? Okay, step one, right? Like I always say, how can I be walking in his ways if I don't know what this word says? You gotta be filling yourself with the word. So often something we run into with people so often when they go, I just don't understand why this is happening. I just can't figure it out. You know, all these different things. How much time do you spend in scripture every day? And this goes for my own life when I'm, I'm getting stressed out and things aren't going on. I go, okay, how much time have I spent in scripture today? Was it just like a real quick reading that I did? And I was like, okay, cool. I can check it off. And I did, or am I really truly spending time on the word of God? When things come up, do I go and search out scripture for that, the help and guidance and wisdom that it brings to deal with whatever this problem is that I'm being faced with? So one, are you filling your heart and your mind with the word of God? Trusting in Christ's empowerment to obey him. Are we truly trusting? Lord, I trust in you. I trust in you that you will help me and you will guide me and you will lead me to obey your ways. And confess and repent when you disobey and fail. We're not going to be perfect. I was talking with a friend yesterday and she said something along the lines of, you know, just kind of having a rough morning and needing a reset. And I said, that is me too. The kids woke up and they're arguing and fighting and bickering. And that made me cranky. And next thing I know, I am walking around and I am not having an attitude for the Lord to serve my family like I should. So I need to sit down. We did our family Bible time. I took a little bit of time to rest and relax and kind of pull myself back together because I said, hey, Lord, help me. Help me to do better. And I apologize for how I've gone about it so far today. I'm, I'm, I'm needing a redo button right here, right now. And I'm moving on forward with a different heart and a different attitude. God's will is more than a duty. It's a joyful opportunity. What a privilege to serve him. I want to know Christ, like Paul said in Philippians 3. When we know Christ, when we fellowship with his people, and when we saturate ourselves in his word, knowing God's will becomes less mysterious, and doing his will tends to follow naturally, or supernaturally, depending on how you look at it. George Muller is one of my favorite people, which I know those of you who have watched my stuff, you're like, Heidi, we know you're really into George Muller. Um, but he was a man of prayer. And I feel like there is so much to be learned by his example. Um, and that's what it is. So often when people go, well, I just keep praying for stuff and I still haven't gotten it. Please keep praying that I get this house or this job or this car or this opportunity or this money or I don't know, whatever it may be that you're praying for. You're not praying for God's will. You're praying for your will. And yes, we can, God knows our heart's desires, but if we got everything our heart desired, what kind of a world would that be, you guys? We need to desire the heart of the Lord. And so, so often when you're like, man, I keep praying and praying and praying, what are you praying for? Are you praying for something like the salvation of an unbelieving spouse or, or children? Or, I mean, 
anyone, right? Are you praying for things truly of the Lord? Lord, please help me to serve this person in this way. If I could, you know, plant a seed or whatever it may be, Lord, soften their hearts to come to the true saving knowledge of you. There's things that are good as we continue to pray and continue to love and serve and act as a Christian should to these people in these situations. But then there's other prayers that are the the just worldly desires of our hearts. We're usually the center of them and some kind of obtaining of some type of object is usually what connects to the, the I in that situation. I'm praying for this house. I'm praying for this car. I'm praying for this job. I'm praying for this financial security. I'm praying for this opportunity. I'm praying whatever. When we're constantly the center and the focus and our receiving of things here in this time, in this life, things that aren't eternal, that's usually a dead giveaway that you are not holding on and trusting and praying for. God's will be done. It's usually a, a pretty dead giveaway of these things. And that's why it is so important to seek God's will. Because as George Muller said, the more and more his prayers and his life aligned with the will of the Lord, the more and more his prayers were answered. If your prayers for things and not that we can't pray. I mean, I pray for the provisions to be able to pay our bills. I pray for, you know, enough food to go around. I pray for, I mean, things that are, are all well and good. But if my prayers seem like they're constantly going unanswered, it's probably because I am not striving for God's will, but I'm striving for my will. God answers every single prayer. Yes, no, no. Not right now. The more and more that you seek, Lord, it's not about what I want. It's not about what I think is best, what I think is needed in this situation. It's about your will being done. And I trust you. I trust you wholeheartedly. So whatever it needs to be, whether I endure hardship and suffering, that's okay, Lord. Let your will be done. That in whatever situation I'm going through, even if it's the most awful thing you could possibly imagine, let your name be glorified. Let people point and see salvation through Christ through the situation. But have you truly, I mean, it's one thing to say these things, right? Like they sound all good and fine and all, but do you truly believe this? Do you truly live it? I don't want anybody talking the talk. I want us walking the walk, right? That's what we have to do. Hebrews 13 verses 20 and 21 say, May the God of peace equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Romans 12 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. Do you test things looking for the discernment for the will of God? These are huge. Charles Spurgeon said, let us pray to the Lord that we may do his will on earth as it is, in, as it is done in heaven. That is joyfully without the slightest weariness. I know some of us are enduring awful things. Are you doing so joyfully without the slightest weariness? When our hearts are right, it is a glad thing to serve God, though it be only to unloose the latches of our master's shoes. C.S. Lewis said, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. Mm. Let's go to epm.org forward slash God's will for the blog post for today, which is is fantastic. I'm trying to get the battery back. Hold, please. Okay, sorry. Let's go to that blog post here. I love talking about the topic of God's will. So important. So this is from April 21st of 2008, and it is called, How Do We Know God's Will? Again, guys, so important. And when we are done with this, we can search the scriptures. We can continue to read on this topic and discuss it and really weigh ourselves on these things. And really stop and look at ourselves with everything that we we pray, that we ask for, we think about, we desire. Am I truly desiring God's will or is this 
my will. It says, I've been thinking lately about how differently I look at God's will now than I did when I came to Christ in high school. When I was a brand new Christian in 1970, I read the books and listened to the tapes about finding God's will. After a few years of this, I began to realize that the assumption seemed to be that God's will was lost. We were looking for it as if it were a buried treasure. But that didn't make sense. Wouldn't God want us to know his will? Why would he hide it from us? It was as if we were assuming God is a cosmic Easter bunny who hides the eggs and maybe says you're getting warmer and sometimes we stumble onto them, but we never know whether we have found them at all or not. I think it's kind of silly, but that's probably the most accurate description of what I think most of us assume God's will is. Kind of funny. In talking with my friends, most of whom, unlike me, had grown up in Christian homes, I found that many assumed God's will was revealed in a dramatic experience or sudden revelation, a voice that says, go on the Mexico trip this summer, or ask Sarah to the prom. Some thought God's will was something to be afraid of. One girl said, I hate spiders and humidity, so I just know God's going to send me to some jungle in South America. Others thought, as many still do, that God's will is nothing but the circumstances that come your way. I've been offered a job there, so it must be God's will. Or he asked me out, so it must be God's will. Or the bank approved my loan application, so it must be God's will. Again, a very big point. Just because something has happened or has come together doesn't... God might be using it, of course, in something, but doesn't mean that God's will is for you to whatever. Especially if it's taking your focus off of serving him and the eternal and puts it here into serving the world and the systems and things of this world. Is God's will mainly about lots of personal details, including school, job, who to date, where to live, etc., or is it about something else? Scripture, I think, gives some clear answers. These passages are worth looking up. So note these down because we are not going to go through all of them or just pull up the blog post yourself and then that way you can go through, like I said, when we're done, let's really dig into scripture and look at these topics. So God's primary will for lost people is that they turn to Christ and be saved. Amen. Second Peter three, nine and first Timothy chapter two, verses three and four. Once we're saved, God has a further will for our lives. There are certain things he wants us to do and not do. He has actually laid out for us certain good works to do to his glory. Go to Ephesians chapter two, verses nine through 10. God's will is something for us to do, not just to believe or affirm, okay? Go to Mark chapter 3, verses 31 through 35, and 1 John 2, 17. Because God loves us, his will for us is in our best interest too. Where God wants us is the very best place to be, the only safe place. So you're far better off in the jungle instead of God's will or sorry, so you're far better off in that jungle inside of God's will, sorry, than in the safest imaginable location outside of God's will. What is to God's glory is also for our good. Go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, Matthew 25, 21, Luke 2, 10, John 16, 7, 1 Corinthians 7, 35, and Ephesians 6, 8. If God wants you in that jungle, you wouldn't be happy anywhere else. God wants us to know his will. He's not cruel. Because he loves us, he gives us his word, the roadmap, so we don't have to grope around in the darkness. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9-10, through 10, and Psalm 119, verse 105. God's will is that we be sexually pure. We see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3-7. through 7. This extends to fleeing from temptation, flee, run, get away. We have a teaching on that if you go back a few videos, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, and keeping our bodies from impurity. It also includes keeping our minds pure. We see that in Matthew 15, verses 19 through 20, Matthew 5, 28, Proverbs 4, 23, Psalm 119, 37, and Philippians 4, verse 8. God says those who don't know his will are unwise, and it is God's will that we be filled with and controlled by his Holy Spirit. Go to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. James 1, 5 says we don't have wisdom because we don't ask for it. So prayer is critical in seeking and living the will of God. 
When we are controlled by the Spirit, we show it in certain ways. We will not commit the acts of a sinful nature, Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, but will produce the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23. It's a great way to test ourselves and other believers around us. It it shows real quick where someone's true heart is when you test these fruits. When in God's will, we'll participate in worshiping the Lord, teaching each other and giving thanks to God and serving others, Ephesians 5, verses 17 through 33. God's will is that we live in submission to God-given authority, that others may see our willingness to humble ourselves as servants, huge key, 1 Peter 2, 13 through 15. It also means we recognize God as our highest authority and put obedience to him and obedience to men. Or sorry, obedience to him above obedience to men. Sorry, guys. That's Acts 4, 18 through 20. Contrary to the false claims of the health and wealth gospel, sometimes God's will is that we go through difficult times, even suffering, to accomplish his purpose in us and through us. 1 Peter three seventeen. For this reason, we should not be surprised by suffering. 1 Peter four nineteen. you guys. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. The Bible is the revealed will of God. If you want to live in his will, then let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. That's Colossians 3.16. Fill your heart and mind with the word of God. Trust in his empowerment to obey him and confess and repent when you disobey and fail. If you do this, you will be living in the will of God, right? We just said that. So to summarize, the will of God is not wrapped up in the details of what we do, but the character of who we are. It is not just the larger choices, but the daily small choices that cumulatively build us into who God wants, wills us to be. God cares about the little things and his will can include details, but those are secondary. What is primary is that we choose to follow his clear direction in spiritual and moral arenas. Then all the details fall into place from there. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. But pause, we hear, give us the desires of our heart. Delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Augustine said, love God and do as you please, because if you're really loving God, you want to do what pleases him. For me, over the years, knowing the will of God has become much easier. It's not that I have to know exactly where to go, but that when I go anywhere, I ask him for direction, seek to surrender each day to Christ and ask him to bring into my life those divine appointments that make life so interesting. In the last several days, I've had them with a tennis player, a coach at a match, a bus driver, a guy in a parking lot, and a neighbor whose dog was on the loose. I often had them in stores and restaurants and on airplanes. God appoints the times and places we live, see Acts 17 for that, and is a master of the exact timing that's the beauty of divine appointments. He says if his wife and him had walked in the restaurant 60 seconds earlier or later, I, would have ha- I wouldn't have had the opportunity to help the woman get the big bag and the two children to her car, and I wouldn't have been able to give her one of my books that shares the gospel. One day I'll get to hear the rest of that story. It's amazing. God's will is more than a duty. It's a joyful opportunity. What a privilege to serve him. I want to know Christ, like Paul said in Philippians 3. When you know Christ, sorry, when you fellowship with his people, and when you saturate yourself in his word, knowing God's will becomes less mysterious and tends to follow naturally or supernaturally. He tugs on your heart and you say yes. And even our saying yes is a work of grace. Amen. I love this topic, you guys, because I think this is so huge. And I really do think it boils down so many of the problems and so many of the things that we see that come in, I know so often, are people who have been taught this, you know, ridiculous health and wealth, gospel, prosperity, whatever you want to call it. We're not seeking God's will. That's what it is. I mean, so much of this boils down to when you, you're you you're frustrated and you're angry and why isn't this happening and why isn't that happening and I'm praying for this and I want this and, and this is good, right? Are you truly in God's word? Are you truly applying these things to yourselves and walking in his way? Are you truly saying, Lord, what is your will? Because the closer I draw to you and I submit to you, the more and more God's will and our prayer life seem to become one. 
If I'm over here praying for all these other things that aren't going through, it's because God's will is not that. He's saying, hey, no. God tells us that he will provide today what we need for today. So guess what? If you and I don't have it today, it's because we don't need it today. Whatever it may be, food, money, clothing, housing, whatever, literally whatever, health. I don't have it today. It's because I don't need it today because I trust that the Lord is going to give me today what I need. And that means if I have all I need and there's excess, I should be so ready to give it away because I know tomorrow God will give me what I need for tomorrow. And I know I can trust in that. And even if that means that my unbelieving spouse or my unbelieving children or whatever, it, it just doesn't get fixed today. That's okay. Because Lord, use me to plant whatever seeds and to serve them and love them in whatever way I need to, that that day will come where it will be the day of their salvation. But truly, do we, do we trust and hang on to these things and abide in his word? So unbelievably important. And I know for myself, I have spent way too many years not living by these things. I have no excuse. I grew up in a Christian home. I went to church all the time. I went to Christian school. I did all of the things. Never understood any of this. I never did. So I know I have plenty of wasted years. But now, now that I know, I have no excuse. None of us now. We just, we're going over this and you're going to go pull up all those scriptures and we're going to go through them, right? We're going to go read through them. And then I want you guys to come and share the things that are standing out to you. Share in the ways that you're like, wow, you're right. I am, I am not looking for God's will. Where are we messing up? Where do we need to do better? Where, where are we working and growing and being changed and transformed by his word in these things? I love hearing you guys share about it. Okay. So let's go look up all those scriptures. Come back here or to the Facebook group and share the things that you stumbled across that really stood out to you guys the most. Praying you all are having a great day. Please reach out if there's anything we can do for you. But otherwise, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye, guys.